In this video tutorial, we're going to use Dream Report to capture batch start and end time from an InTouch application, either InTouch or application server, with data being logged into Wonderware Historian, and then create a batch report in Dream Report using this information. So here's a little uh, batch reactor application. We have a batch ID uh, that's being uh, automatically generated every few minutes. And then we also have a push button to indicate the start and the end of a batch. So let's go ahead and launch Dream Report Studio and create a new project. Let's give our project a name. Set some localization parameters. Now we're going to connect up to a couple of data sources. For my real-time data, I'm going to connect to InTouch. Of course, this could be an application server object we're looking at as well. Uh, but in this case, what I want to do is connect to my InTouch application so I can grab the batch, uh, batch name or the batch ID, as well as the bit which indicates the batch start and stop status. So let me import my tags from the InTouch app. There we have them and add that to my list of configured drivers. We'll also connect to Wonderware Historian so that we can actually report on raw process data over the duration of a specific batch ID. I have my Historian in the background running and collecting all the data from InTouch. We'll use Delta Retrieval, just leave the defaults. Okay. Now, let's go ahead and create a logging group to record the batch ID changing in InTouch. This batch ID is going to be logged to the internal Dream Report database, and we're going to set it up to be logged on change. So let's get that batch string tag. The other tag we're going to take is also the batch status tag to show us when the batch physically starts and ends. And again, we'll record both of these on change with Delta Storage. Start monitoring them, making sure that we are receiving these data points from InTouch. Now that we've set up a logging group, we're going to define our batch definition. We'll create the new batch ID, give it a name, and then for our source of data to feed the batch ID, we're going to go to Dream Report History and choose that batch string tag that we have just created. That's all we need to do. The batch string is defined. And now we can start building our first report. So let's put a freeform table on this report that we'll use to show our batch header information. For instance, the batch ID, the start time, the end time, and the batch duration. Now that we have the basic table format on the screen, put some headers in there. Put the report print date up at the top. Now let's put a single data item in the first cell, and for that we'll show the batch ID. We'll choose the time duration to be the last one batch, referencing the batch ID we just defined. For our statistical function, we're going to choose the batch ID, and that's it. Now for the start time, again we'll put another single data object the last batch and the statistical function we're going to choose for this time is going to be the batch start time again for the last one batch do the same thing now another single data object and we'll use the built-in function for the batch end time 
under the batch functions list. Again, referencing the last batch. And finally, for the duration, we can use the built-in statistical function called batch duration for the last batch. So let's go and pick that under the batch functions, batch duration. And there we have our report header. Now let's go ahead and put a line chart or a trend onto our report just so that we can show data over the duration of this batch. So we choose a line chart, add a couple of pens to this chart. So we'll choose these tags from Wonderwear Historian. And we'll get our reactor level and temperature. And for the duration, the time duration, instead of using a date and time, we will use the last batch for our batch start and end time. Set some formatting options, and we should be good to go with our chart. There we have it. Now let's go and run our report. Pick the report from the list. And before we generate it, we'll go ahead and start a new batch. That was batch number 166-6 and it started at 428.30 p.m. And let's go directly to the end time of the batch. And then we'll start a new batch. And there we started a new batch at 4.29 and 30 seconds. So we're now on batch 197-7. Okay, so that previous batch ran for about a minute or so. Now let's go ahead and generate the report. And remember the report is based off of the last batch. So there we see the report generated of the time period that we started a, a batch until the time we started the next batch and that was 4.28.30 to 4.29.30, almost 30. So almost one minute duration and our trend reflects that. Okay, what we're going to do now is take another look at how we might do this batch report where we have a physical start and stop status bit being, indicating the actual change or the start and the stop of the batch. In the first example, we just assume that the end of one batch implied the start of the next one. But in this case, the batch could be set up. It might take a while to set the batch up. And then somebody actually presses a button to start the batch. In that case, what we're going to do is in our HMI or app server or the PLC, hold a bit high or set that value to one for the duration of the batch and then reset it to zero through some uh, either push button or some logic that says that the batch has ended. There might be again a changeover, next batch ID is, uh, is assigned, and then a short while later somebody presses the start button, again batch status goes to one and the process is repeated. So the key to this is identifying or capturing the start time when that batch status bit goes to one, and capturing the timestamp when it goes to zero, and then that of course indicates the end of the batch. To do that, we're going to copy our original batch report and we're going to make some modifications to it. We'll leave the batch ID being the same, the last batch. But for the start time, we're not going to use the built-in batch start time parameter or function, but rather we're going to find the timestamp or the first timestamp when our batch status tag, which we'll pick here, equals 1. So give us the timestamp of the first value. So now we go under the advanced SQL condition and we browse for that tag from our uh, HMI. So batch status, add that, equals 1. So we're looking for the timestamp in the duration of that last batch ID 
when that status bit went to 1. Likewise, for the end time, we'll find the timestamp of the last value. So we'll choose that parameter, again of the batch status tag. But in this case, for our advanced SQL condition, we want to say where batch status equals zero. So we want to know the last time that that batch status bit goes to zero. It should be the first and the last should be one and the same because that, that bit should not transition multiple times during the course of a single batch ID. And finally, for the duration, instead of using the built-in duration function, we're going to use an expression object and all we're going to do here is subtract the start time that we've just calculated from the end time. And again, we pick those. Those are two objects from our report. And the result representation will show it as a duration in hours, minutes, seconds. Okay, now that we have that batch start time and batch end time uh, values on our report, for all subsequent uh, trends, charts, calculations, instead of doing the last batch, we're going to use something now called a calculated time period and simply reference those two parameters in our report. So and again, we need to do this for all tags. So batch start, batch end. And we could, for instance, put a statistical table or just a raw item table on our report. Pick a few tags. And we'll get those from our Wonderware historian. Let's get some flow tags here. Add them to our list. And again, for our time period, we'll use a calculated time period and reference those calculated batch start and batch end times that we came up with in our header. Now, let's uh, reload our reports and simulate the running of a batch. And you'll see what we do here is start a batch so it'll generate a new batch ID. And then a short time afterwards, so here we're running 703-5 caffeine. And a short time afterwards, we'll hit the start button. And that's the batch status bit going high at 1207.10. Now the batch is running. Switch over to the end and press stop, 1208.10. The batch ID is still the same, 703-5. Maybe we make some changes, get setting up for the next batch and we start the next batch 672-6 do a little more setup and then a short while after that we'll hit the start button again for that one okay so let's go and take a look at the last one we ran and generate that report and there you'll see it captured the time that we actually hit the start button and the time we hit the stop button and only report the uh, batch data over the duration of the batch status equaling to one, not over the entire time that that batch ID was B703-5. So that's the difference between using the, just the basic batch ID to record start and end time or the end of a batch ID implying the start of the next versus actually using a bit to indicate the batch starting and ending. Here we're doing another one. We're going to stop it at 12.10 for the dash 6 batch. And let's go ahead and take a look at this batch, which ran for a longer duration now. That should be dash 6. And there, that one ran for a minute and 25 seconds again, capturing the times that we press the start and stop button.